This is Legacy Battle. Make sure you hit that like, subscribe, notification button. I'm Michael Adams, creator of Legacy Battle. My panelists tonight from the Gridiron Battle Zone, Brian King, Steelers Nation South, Rollo Coffin. And we want to welcome back Legacy Battle's uh, movie specialist, Stephen King. You can check him out on some of our uh, prior celebrity guest shows. Our special guest tonight uh, is going to be debating with us the greatest off-field sports film in the drama section. Uh, that category basically means like GMs, scouts, agents, etc. She's just going to give her opinion on some of the acting and 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 things like that. Uh, but she is a Canadian actress who has appeared in TV and film to include uh, Napoleon Dynamite, which is just a cult classic movie here uh, in the states. Uh, Midway, The Dead Zone, Due South, many many more. And of course, she is a very very famous voiceover actress. She has done roles in Dune. Uh, she's Captain Phasma in Star Wars Resistance and Lego Star Wars Resistance Rises. Uh, she's won several awards. She's been nominated for even more. So we, we have the actress Ellen Dubin here. Ellen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Awesome. <laughs> so as always, we will have our Q&A for her about her career after. Uh, and we're going to start tonight out with, with Brian. What film you got, Brian? All right. Well, we got Moneyball. Um, Moneyball came out in 2011, and it starred Brad Pitt and Jonah Hill. Uh, this movie did pretty well, 7.6 out of 10 on the uh, IMDb uh, scale there. Uh, it was nominated for six Academy Awards, 94% on the Rotten Tomatoes, and it made $110 million at the box office. So this movie was inspired by the real-life story of the 2002 Oakland A's uh, baseball club. Uh, Brad Pitt plays the A's general manager, Billy Bean, and Jonah Hill plays Peter Brand. Uh, as the movie opens up, you realize that the A's have two big problems uh, just months before the new season is set to begin. Firstly, they have uh, they, they lose three of their top players to free agency. And secondly, when Billy Bean goes to A's ownership seeking an increase in the min minuscule uh, $35 million payroll, he is denied. Meanwhile, teams like the Yankees and the Red Sox, they're working with payrolls that are five and six times that much. So Bean summed up the dilemma pretty well with this quote. He said, the problem we are trying to solve is that there are rich teams, there are poor teams, then there's 50 feet of crap, and then there's us. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Bean has a, he has a meeting with, uh, with his team of scouts, and he's deeply troubled because – all they provide him with are conventional solutions, solutions that have been around in the game for decades, like a, a player's looks and his confidence and, and those types of things. And Bean just knew that to be successful, they were going to have to think outside of the box. So Bean is finally presented with a solution to his dilemma when he meets Peter Brand, who is a low-level assistant in the Cleveland uh, Indians uh, front office. So Bean could tell that Brand was an unconventional thinker. And so he set up a super secret meeting with him in the parking garage, and he offers him the assistant GM job in Oakland. So Brand's M.O. was to not worry about frivolous attributes of a player, but rather focus solely on their average win and average run totals. Um, so all that matters when replacing players who have departed for bigger contracts are those two factors. So he goes on to build, build a cheap roster for the A's that way. Initially, the plan seems to backfire. There's much tension in the clubhouse, but eventually the team starts winning and believing in themselves, and they go on to set a major league record with 20 consecutive wins. And then after a very successful season ends, Bean is offered a job by the Red Sox to implement his system that he and Brand used in Oakland, but he turned it down, betting on himself for the future. So uh, a few MLB players uh, made cameos in this film. You had Chad Kruder, uh, Darren Ebert, and Royce Clayton. All in all, it was a quality film. Uh, it was good for the average person who likes an inspiring underdog story. And it was good for someone who likes a solid mix of comedy and drama. And superb for the sports diehard who likes to see the behind-the-scenes inner workings of the game revealed. So, Ellen, uh, with this one, I want to ask you specifically – about Jonah Hill. So this is an actor who, before this film, was all comedy. Yeah. You know, we had we hadn't seen him do something like this. Now he's Oscar nominated. You know, so how hard is it for an actor to switch, like, 
just to just make that jump and 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 basically change uh you know everything they've done in the past well i think first of all this is a brilliant move uh from his management team sort of like a great sports uh, agents move you know to put a player in a different position or whatever so it was it really woke me up watching this movie it was a huge departure because he tends to at at that point in time do more broader comedy and this was more underplayed and i th i thought the chemistry between him and Brad Pitt is an extraordinary actor and they i felt they matched each other really well and went toe to toe uh very well the chemistry even if you're not a sports fan and as um he said earlier this is a great movie for sports fans but even if you're not a sports fan you would appreciate the camaraderie you'd appreciate the underdog story it's a very a human story and a, of the human condition so that would be i think it had a, a universal appeal to a lot of people and jonah hill yeah it woke me up i went wow how hard is it if you're a great actor it isn't hard it's just a matter of getting that opportunity because a lot of times you know you're slotted and typecast into something else and as i said at the beginning this was a brilliant maneuver to show uh, i find that a lot of comedy actors have a great ability to do drama it's yeah. they've got a lot of guts and a lot of a lot of soul so um i thought it was great i actually really enjoyed this movie i really did yeah. and we kind of had the same thing with Brad Pitt he went from like yeah punk to leading man you know yeah. like his earlier films he was just like the male sex symbol there and then you know they would do sketches of him on uh Saturday Night Live of how dumb he was and like it turns out the man is super smart and a fantastic actor so it, he's it's a character awesome actor in a with a leading man's face and body yeah. and uh, and he also had an interesting edge in Moneyball you were kind of like wondering what the hell's going on with this character which i find fascinating he wasn't predictable right and and brian i just want to throw out one more quote from that movie because it's one of my favorite sport quotes of all time is when he said uh he hates losing even more than he likes winning yeah uh, right, yeah, right. And that's, that's a great quote that's so. brilliant that, i think a lot of people from the business would tell you that's their biggest driver you know yeah you'd rather you just you just hate the losing because you hate all the the, the uh, blowback you get from it <laughs> yeah exactly so let's move on to our next film uh that's gonna be me i've got trouble with the curve so 2012 uh budget of 60 million only brought in 49 million so when you add in advertising and everything else this one actually lost a, a pretty penny here um but it's just starring the the probably the biggest legend tonight uh clint eastwood amy adams you know she, she went from uh you know, just guesting on some uh, shows back in the, the late 90s, early 2000s to becoming probably one of the, if not the biggest actress in Hollywood, one of the biggest, biggest actresses in Hollywood. And Justin Timberlake and John Goodman, they have like smaller roles in this film. Um, but to me, this movie is about old school baseball scouting uh, against like the new age uh, computer stats scouting. Kind of almost goes against Brian's movie, who, you know, they brought in the Moneyball aspect, and this kind of goes against that. Um, but Clint Eastwood's character, who is is basically someone who is near the end of his road, trying to reconnect with his daughter. Um, and sometimes, you know, you find out, like, that the best packages have flaws. And we see that in the star athlete in this film. And we shouldn't underestimate the little guy. So it's good messages in this film. 51% on Rotten Tomatoes. Audience cinema score, B+. Plus. So it's doing a lot better on cinema score than it is on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, now, this was Clint Eastwood's first acting film after Gran Torino, and it was a few years later down the road. And a lot of that character from uh, Gran Torino, you see it in this one, like the grumpy old man, like, get off my lawn, you know, type stuff. <laughs> And you don't want to say, like, Clint Eastwood has been stereotyped in acting, but he's kind of made a career off of that. So um, it's an enjoyable film. I don't know if I can say it's the best tonight, uh, but, you know, we'll leave that to the vote later, of course. So, Ellen, my, with Clint Eastwood, let, let me ask you about this, because I've always kind of wondered, 
this is an actor who, you know, he was one of the biggest actors in the 70s, 80s, probably 60s as well. Becomes a director, and he is like one of the biggest directors in Hollywood now. So have you worked for any actors that also directed? And like, what's the difference between one who is an actor and then one who's not an actor? First, I have to talk about Clint Eastwood as a director, because my dearest, yeah. one of my dearest friends, I, I mean, it's actually... I would say every actor's dream to work with him because he's a legend. He doesn't say action. He's very, this is very famous about him. He does, cause I heard, I asked her everything uh, about working with him. Um, he doesn't say action. He just sort of goes like this with his hand roll because he doesn't want, even the best actor all of a sudden is like, you know, you're at the bath, you know, you're up and pad and you have to swing. So it just gets you with a lot of anxiety. So he really likes you to sort of ease into it and, and he only does one or two takes, you know, yes. that, that's what he's known for. You know, she'd work with Robert De Niro too, who does 85 takes, but Clint Eastwood is the complete opposite. And he's so laid back, you know, that sort of laid back energy that he had in all his cowboy movies. So anyway, I just had to tell you that because what everybody says about his directing is that he's phenomenal. So we all aspire to work with him. He's 93. So, um, I like it when an actor is a director on the whole. I'm just going through my history of people who have been actors because they know what it takes to do a performance. They've been in the trenches. Um, other times on the, on, the, on the more negative side, they can want to jump in and act the role for you. <laughs> <laughs> so they'll, give you, they'll give you line readings or they'll tell you how to do it and so you just sort of have to you have to have eternal patience as an actor anyway um so there's that sort of balance i think to find and and uh i wanted to get your thoughts on justin timberlake as an actor because we're looking at someone that went from mickey mouse club to in sync <laughs> to you know he hasn't I don't think he's been like the star in any movie, but I mean, how do you think he does? I think he's actor? wonderful. Yeah. I think he's really natural. And actually, I just saw him in something the other day. Trying to remember, it was um, he was a real bad guy. He's in a real estate agent in a house, and his wife was murdered. It's one of the net. I think a recent Netflix movie. He's a phenomenal villain. Um, oh, okay. Because he's just so low key. I think he's a major talent as an actor. I, I was really a, enjoy walking him, watching him. It's a, it was a big surprise as well, in a different way, like Jonah Hill in the last movie. Um, there, it, it just uh, he he can he can really throw throw a good curveball as an actor. Yeah, he, he was a star. Win. He was a star in a movie with Mila Kunis. It was a love story, to, like that's a rom com. Right. Yes, that's right. Yeah. 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 He was also it, like a, yeah. Yeah, he was also the lead in In Time, which is a dystopian future movie. Yeah, which he was... actually is like the main character and it does a very good job. Okay. Right. Excellent. Well, uh, let's move on. To... Oh, yeah. Let's move on to Steven. All right. Uh, I was excited about the film uh, that I got picked for Jerry Maguire. Um, oh. Released in 1996 at a runtime of two hours and 18 minutes, Tom Cruise plays the titular sports agent based on real life agent Lee Steinberg, a lovable loser who has an epiphany, writes a long mission statement, sending himself into a career and personal crisis. Um, this film won Cuba Gooding Jr. an Oscar and blessed the world with such everlasting catchphrases as you had me at hello, you complete me, and of course, show me the money. Um, this is just a classic tale of a lot of desperate people coming together to kind of all achieve success together. When you look at the three main characters of uh, Tom Cruise, Renee, Z Renee, Renee Zellweger, and uh, Cuba Gooding Jr., they're kind of all in a place in their life where things are a little bit more desperate, and so they kind of all have to come together to work together and achieve the success that they need. Um, also spawned in my opinion, the greatest quitting of a job scene of all time. <laughs> Whenever he yells, who's coming with me? And I'm not going to flip out. Uh, Jim Brewer actually copies this in Half-Baked, which makes for a really funny sequence, you know, <laughs> a little mov movie in a movie joke. Um, Cameron Crowe originally wrote the script for Tom Hanks, which I thought was interesting because it would be such a different movie, I feel like, than the energy wow. that Tom Cruise brought to it. Yeah. Um, some other fun facts are Cuba Gooding Jr. showed up nude to audition with Tom Cruise because it was supposed to be for a crazy athlete, so he was trying to fit the role. <laughs> um, 
Jonathan Lipnicki, the little kid who was in this, uh, and also as well as in Stuart, Will Stuart Little, he became an MMA fighter uh, eventually. So it's kind of interesting to see that transformation. We had a chance to look up that picture or put it in the podcast, Mike. Um, it's the fifth highest grossing romantic drama of all time. It was $50 million budget with a whopping $273 million gross worldwide, which is nuts when you think about it. It ranked 18th on the list grossing of 1996, beating out such classics as Toy Story, Jumanji, The Cable Guy, Beavis and Butthead to America, Heat, and Happy Gilmore, which is kind of crazy when you think about all those movies now. Um, Cuba Gooding Jr. did all of his own stunts. Uh, another random fun fact is that the human head actually weighs 11 pounds. The little kid, John Philip Nicky, keeps saying in the movie, the human head weighs 8 pounds, which is not true. I just think it's kind of funny because you hear that fact repeated a lot. Uh, some of my notes for the movie, I think this is one of the best acting roles um, for Renee Zellweger and for Cuba Gooding Jr. Cuba Gooding Jr. tends to be over the top a lot, but this role fits really perfectly for his style. Renee Zellweger looked very, very beautiful in the movie. Um, it was kind of one of her early breakout roles. I loved how the titular characters were in very desperate circumstances. I mean, you can almost feel the culpable depression in like the show me the money scene. Um, whenever he's quitting and he has his goldfish flipper and he's like, who's coming with me and flipper. And then right after he lands, uh, the athlete, he's singing Free Fallen by himself in the car. And I think we've all kind of had that human moment where we're excited about something. At, right after it happens, you start singing along to the radio. Um, but it was really cool because in Color of Money, Paul Newman kind of plays the manager character and Tom Cruise kind of plays the wild talent. And now he's kind of reversing the roles of him being the manager character and Cuba Gooding Jr. being the wild talent. And um, I just thought it was a hugely different role for Tom Cruise. I mean, he mostly played good guys, really, other than Interview to a Vampire, Interview with a Vampire up to that point. So this is the first really complicated role where he's kind of a jerk, but he's also lovable and a little bit of an anti-hero, and you end up liking him in the end. Um, the director does a phenomenal job with the soundtrack and cinematography to connect you really deeply with the main characters. So those quotes you gave me, uh, you had me at hello. AFI has that as the 52nd uh, greatest quote in movie history of all time. And uh, show me the money is even higher than that. It's at uh, twenty five. So that's an impressive list to make that. So yeah, Ellen, I never uh, realized that you complete me came from that movie either because you've heard that in so many other you know yeah. cheesy scenes yeah. after the fact. I mean, let's also throw out that you had me at hello was um, turned into a like Kenny Chesney hit song, and then he ended up marrying the Renee Zellweger. So there was that aspect. Yeah, of that really I didn't too. think about that's that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, Ellen, your, your, your thoughts on this film? And, and oh. I mean, we all know Tom Cruise is probably the biggest star in the world. And, and late great Kelly Preston was in this one, too. Yes, so. yes, she was. Yes. Uh, I, this movie is phenomenal. Again, it's uh, a universal appeal. And anybody, it, again, you don't have to love sports, but boy, do you love sports from this movie. There was a lot of, I like underdog characters and flawed characters that learn things in movies, no matter what genre movie it is. And as, as Steven said, uh, Tom Cruise was an anti-hero and you hated him and you loved him. And then Cuba go to Junior, someone was like, enough already. Shut up. Just go play. Do your thing. <laughs> enough. You know, um, and, you know, the little kid kind of stole the show. <laughs> Jonathan Lipnicki and you, you have to google him and see the adult now because you just can't help look at the little spiked little, little head of, of his and as he said Renee Zellweger was a breakout role it was a it's a love story it's an ode to the love of sports the love of two lovers you know a man and a woman or whatever and and I just think I think it's a wonderful movie yeah, I, I'll, I'm, I'll never forget, uh, I, you never forget those phrases. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn from Gone with the Wind is the number one quote of all times. So for those quotes to get into the top 50 with a movie like Gone with the Wind, I was I remember this because I was looking up top quotes a couple of weeks ago. And I was looking and seeing that uh, Jerry Maguire had several quotes in there. Yeah. An another note I forgot to mention um, is in one of the opening scenes, whenever he's visiting the athlete in the hospital, uh, the athlete's son says he's had four concussions already. One is enough enough. And I thought that was such like an ode to what ended up happening with the NFL way later, like way after 1996 of concussion protocol and CTE. And I thought it was almost like a 
one of those scenes that kind of predicted the future of what was going to happen with, with sports and kind of yeah. from the yeah, foreshadowing kind of from the agent role as well, because you're seeing it from someone who is making money off of that athlete being healthy. Right. Uh, and our honorable mention tonight, uh, the film that just missed list is concussion. So there you go. Thank you for bringing that up. But so we've done GMs, we've done scouts, we've done uh, agents. We're going to go back for our final film for some GM uh, work here. Rollo, what movie are you bringing us? Uh, I got Draft Day, uh, which was based off of the Pittsburgh Steelers' main rival, one of the main rivals, Cleveland Browns. So, boo. Uh, <laughs> boo. It was directed by <laughs> Ivan Reitman, stars Kevin Costner, um, uh, Jennifer Garner, um, the late great Chadwick Boseman, um, yes. and and a multitude of uh, NFL players like Ray Lewis, um, Arian Foster, um, also had Roger Goodell, John Gruden, and it was the last movie that Jim Brown was in uh, before, you know, the late great Jim Brown. Uh, Bernie Kosar was in the movie. But the movie was originally scheduled to be uh, for the Buffalo Bills, but the production team actually moved it to Cleveland because the production cost was cheaper, which probably forced why they didn't. It was such a box office flop. Uh, it was on a budget of $25 million. It only only picked up twenty nine point five million dollars at the box office, but it was it was a good movie. You know, it's sixty percent on Rotten Tomatoes. People do like the movie; it just, they just didn't go out to see it, probably because it was the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> so, Ellen, I've heard for this movie that the filming days were insane. Uh, I know you've been on a lot of sets. Like, tell us about being on a set. How long is a typical day for a film? And and I guess, uh, as Rollo mentioned, they had to move it because of money. So money kind of factors in everything, I'm guessing, right? Money makes the world go round. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sometimes. Um, well, you know, union rules, there's a certain amount of time you're supposed to work, you know, nine hours, which means eight hours because there's an hour for lunch and some breaks in between. But we all know. Generally, everything you worked on is goes into overtime. It's like overtime and when the score is tied in a game. Uh, you know, I've worked 17, 18 hours on a set, and usually they're the most physically grueling parts I've had. It just, it, I can't just be sitting at a kitchen table in, in a scene. It's, you know, when I'm bobbing in water or, you know, doing some kind of weird stunt or, you know, jumping from one platform to another. So, yeah, the hours can be grueling and you, and, very hard on you physically and you have to learn how to sort of take cat naps in between with your eyes open so you're always aware as to what's going on but you know what I'd, I'd rather be doing that than not working so that's my choice yeah and Kevin Costner I mean he has done a lot of sports films we know he's a very good actor so what are your thoughts on Kevin Costner Kevin Costner has made some of the most iconic sports movies baseball movies of all time Bull Durham Field of Dreams uh, I think Bull Durham is voted the number one sports movie of all times with Field of Dreams coming in second. And uh, they're incredible movies. Uh, just absolutely. And Kevin Costner is very pro prolific. He's always making, what, what's he, he's got that show now on, on Yellowstone. 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 Which I actually am behind. I just started watching <laughs> season one. It's incredible. <laughs> Um, so he's the king. I think he's made 10 sports films. If if you look him up, I think he's made 10 sports films and he's also been in it. And he was a collegiate baseball player. So I think he's living vicariously as an actor to make sports movies because he really wanted to do that uh, before he became an actor. Well, we've debated both those baseball films in prior shows and also Tin yeah. Cup where he was a golfer. So we, we had that in our, our golf show with actor Brian McNamara. So let's move into our vote tonight. Cannot pick your own. Brian, you're in my top corner. Who are you taking? Yeah, this is uh, it's tough because I, I love all these movies. Um, I, for me, Trouble with the Curve, I mean, it was pretty much all about Clint Eastwood. It didn't really, I don't think it really developed the other characters that much, unfortunately. Um same with draft day it was kind of all about all about kevin coster but um but you know with uh you know, with jerry mcguire it's just it was just so much spun off from that and so many different characters so many little subplots that were enjoyable and everything so to me it, jerry mcguire is just a total package so i gotta go with that one steven um 
I, you know, I've seen Trouble with the Curve and Draft Day. I, I enjoy almost all of Kevin Costner's movies, and Draft Day was really, really good. Um, but, you know, I'm going to have to pick Moneyball. Moneyball was one of those movies where it kind of, you know, went under my radar for a while, and I had a couple of people suggest it to me. I'm not the biggest baseball fan, so I sat down, I watched it, and it just the acting just blew me away in it, you know. And um, I kind of felt for it more being from Pittsburgh and having a franchise similar to the Oakland A's where we're at the bottom as well. Um, kind of uh, you could identify with where they were at as a baseball team. And uh, I just the performances from Jonah Hill and Brad Pitt in that movie are amazing. So I'm at to say Moneyball. Rollo. I've seen Jerry Maguire 11 times. <laughs> I own it. I own it. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. it'll be Jerry Maguire. Sorry, you gotta watch it tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> so co- coming in tonight, I I uh I do enjoy Retraft Day Rallo, but I, I don't think it's at the quality of Jerry Maguire and Moneyball. Um and same with my film, I don't think it's at that quality either. But I, I was torn between these two. I mean, I I own them both, <laughs> Jerry Maguire and Moneyball. They're they're phenomenal films. And they both have Oscar nominations in them, so it's it's, it's really hard for me to 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 go either way. I I think though I am just I'm gonna go Moneyball, and, and I think the reason is because I do like the transition of Jonah Hill in that film, seeing him in a different light. Um, I feel like I've seen Tom Cruise act crazy. I mean, Ben Stiller does a great impression of him, you know. Acting crazy, uh, so you know I've just kind of seen it before. Um, so yeah, I'm going to take Moneyball. So Ellen, uh, we come to you. What would be your pick for tonight? Uh, where do we add here? Are we? Is, is this the tiebreaker here? No, yeah, yep. Oh. It, it is two to two. A, yeah, I picked that day. Day. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they have. They both have wonderful assets. I I have to go with my first gut, and it's Jerry Maguire. I've seen that movie mm-hmm. about 15 times. And right. uh, I just love the I got, story. So. I got to catch you now, Ellen. I got to catch you now. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's a win for Stephen. Congrats, Stephen. Uh, let's move into our Q&A. Uh, you get the wins. So you got first question. Then we'll go uh, Brian Rollo me. Okay. Um, Ellen, I don't know if any of the other panelists were as excited uh, to talk to one of the voices from Skyrim, but I am a huge video game nerd, and the Elder Scrolls franchise were one of my favorites, both Marwyn and Oblivion, and then obviously Skyrim. Um, I was just so curious about the voice acting process. Now, how long does that process take to do a voice for a character? I don't think that the rest of the panelists understand. There's like 30 races in this game. It, the, the map is probably about 20 miles wide, and it could take you two years to beat the game. So the amount of voice acting that goes into a video game of that expanse, I just can't even imagine. So my, I guess my two questions are, how long does that process take for you personally? And how many voice actors do you need for a game, a game that that's expansive and, and goes on for that long? That's a great question. Each video game has a different, you know, a record time frame. For Skyrim, just so you can get um, a scope as to what the amount of amount of actors that were booked on that, there were three studios going on: one in Los Angeles, one in England, and one in New York. I, I wow. mostly part time in Los Angeles, so uh, and there were three directors. So you can imagine the coordination of something like that. There's thousands of characters in it. I yeah, I, I didn't even know because I, I was booked as common woman, and they don't tell you a lot. There's a lot of NDAs in in uh, video games. Everything's an NDA, and you don't get till you get in the room. You don't know what you're doing. But apparently, I played over eighty characters. Um, yeah, it's a lot. It, it's a lot. Wow. And uh, the director, you'd have all the people on the phone from Beth- uh, uh, yes, Bethesda. That was Bethesda. Bethesda. And, yep. Uh, who do brilliant games, big, brilliant AAA games. And these are huge worlds. And, you know, the, you'll have a guy who was the creator and they've been working on it for 10 years. And they'll say, okay, your character, he's your brother. And he was such and such. And they know every little detail about, you know, who, what the relationships are and all that kind of stuff. So it's really interesting to deal with the creators. And Bethesda is very hands-on. So not only do you have the director in the actual studio, but you'll have people on on a phone call. Um, it varies. That one took over a year for me. And then wow. after that year, we had, now you're not doing it every day, but yeah. you know, it's divided up. And then there's downloadable content, DLC. So mm-hmm. I think I did two other games since that one, two or three. 
Um, and then you go and it varies. It could be once a month, once every two weeks, once every four months. It just depends. But that was a massive undertaking. It's a masterpiece, really, as far as video games go. I agree. It's. I was very thrilled. And it was one of my first games to work on. So That's open. the only game I know it has been released on seven separate consoles now. That's right. Oh. Yeah, like, they keep re-releasing it on new consoles because it's so popular. <laughs> You'll be pleased to know that there'll be more content for sure. Thank you. I, That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Alan, you, you were able to play a role on the, the strange but hilarious comedy Napoleon Dynamite. Uh, you know, Eileen, the Tupperware loving mom. Uh, how was that experience, and and how did that come about? Oh, huh. Well, as I tell all actors, you never know where your next job is going to come from, so you always have to do a good job on the one before. And that came about because I did a crazy sci-fi show called Lex, L-E-X-X, -X, and uh, it's sort of the first, uh, just before Farscape, uh, one of the, it's sort of like a combination of Doctor Who meets a wacky sex comedy. It's a very strange show. Uh, you'll never forget it. Anyway, one of I got interviewed for a sci-fi magazine called Cinescape by a, a man named Chris Wyatt. And uh, flash forward after we did the interview, he said, listen, I'm doing this movie. I'm producing this movie called Napoleon Dynamite in Preston, Idaho. Do you want to be in it? Nobody ever asked me to be in a movie before. He sent me the script and I went, what the hell is this? <laughs> 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 a llama and this and I'm like this okay what the heck I've never been anywhere like this before so I flew there and uh it's just making me laugh just thinking about it right now and watching seeing John Heater in my head because he we never saw him who played Napoleon on the set till literally I opened the door and that was my first glimpse at him and if you know my face I was biting down on my tongue so hard because it was my first shot of the day and you want to do a good job and look like you're concentrating. I thought my tongue was going to bleed with because I was biting down so hard not to laugh my head off because of the teeth and the hair and, and, <laughs> and, fresh there. and I, I went, and if you know me, you'll see this pause and everybody thought, oh, that's really good acting. You're looking at Napoleon. No, I was trying not to laugh my ass off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's um and and you know what the great thing is everybody is that it's a movie that doesn't have tom cruise in it or you know a huge a-list movie star and it made a lot of money and it really resonated with everybody a lot of people listen all of us if you if you don't admit it everybody is an it has a nerd in them you know, we would be our wonderful selves. I think if you don't have a nerd or something nerdy about you, there's something wrong with you. That's my philosophy in life. <laughs> we all have our quirks and our own interesting little, you know, mannerisms and habits. And uh, I think that a lot of people, it really became the comedy of a generation. A lot of people identified with it. Yeah. I, I was four. I was 14 whenever that movie came out in high school, and it was like within a week of it being out, everyone was saying, like, here's your dinner, Tina, and, you know, vote for Pedro. It just became one of those things where it was like in the ethos of jokes, and I still hear people randomly quote, you know, a Napoleon Dynamite line, you know, just as jokingly, and then you pick it up because you grew up, like you said, and I grew up in that generation that it was very popular. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I should look at those phrases that we were talking about earlier, show me the money, and frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn, and see if this is in the top 100, you know, the Swede and the, the tater tot lines, and maybe, I bet you there might be, or at least in the top yeah. 150. Yeah, you might have snuck in there, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Point. <laughs> Go ahead, Rollo. Piggy, piggybacking off of Brian and, and the pulley and dynamite, it was, uh, the budget was like $400,000, I read, and when you guys were filming this money I and mean, filming this movie with that budget and the quirky storyline, did you expect it to do the numbers that it did and become an iconic movie in movie history? <clears throat> Wonderful question. And the answer is no. No one in their wildest dreams. I mean, you want every, every project you do, you want to be successful, whatever that means to you. But no, it was so weird and quirky. And, you know, the budget, as you said, was so, I remember the food was really awful. We had one bread and cheese, <laughs> you know, the squeezy cheese whiz. 
and apples. You know, there's no craft service where you get roast beef. Or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We didn't even get tater tots. And, <laughs> and I remember sitting outside with Efren Ramirez, who I'd done another movie with, my first movie ever in L.A., if you want to. One of the best, worst movies of all time, Tammy and the Teenage T-Rex. And Efren was in that, too. And we were reminiscing about this movie that starred the great late Paul Walker and Denise Richards and Terry Kaiser from uh, Weekend at Bernie's. Anyway, so Efren and I were in. It was one of our first movies in L.A. And we're sitting on swings, you know, while we're waiting for the next shot to line up. And we're just laughing at this low-budget movie in somebody's backyard because every every set piece there was somebody's home or the library or the school. So the town of Preston was actually the actual, you know, places that Jared Hess had grown up with, the director. So the budget was, the sets were all donated. Basically everybody in the town helped out. So I did, I never ate cheese whiz after that. <laughs> it was enough. So, so you mentioned everybody's got a little nerd in them. Star Wars is my my geek out. I uh, I've seen everything Star Wars, so uh, I just wanted to ask you, like, how did you get the 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 role of Captain Phasma there, and and what does it mean to you to be in something as huge as the Star Wars world? Because that will go on forever. Yeah, I uh, <laughs> when I booked that, I'll start with the what I felt when I booked the Star Wars um, Captain Phasma. I was absolutely over the moon because it is it's one of the biggest if not the biggest franchise in sci-fi in history i mean everybody knows something about star wars even if you're not a, a fan um how i got it was very interesting i was taking a class a voiceover class in la with a woman named Lindsay halper and you again it goes back to you never know who's listening or who's watching and she heard something in my voice. I didn't specifically audition for Captain Phasma. She heard something, and I guess something I did in the class, and she offered me the role through my agent of Captain Phasma, first in the Lego Star Wars. I did, I think, eight television specials as Captain Phasma. Now, I panicked. First of all, I was excited, but then I panicked because I'm not an actor who loves doing sound-alikes. And not only did I have to honor the incredible Game of Thrones Gwendolyn Christie, who I love, you know, you want to do a good extra special job is you also have to be, well, you have to get the style of it. The style it wasn't so hard, but to get her voice, I thought I couldn't do it, but obviously casting thought I could. And unfortunately they didn't have any clips from the movie at the time. So I had to watch her being an interviewed by Craig Ferguson, even though it wasn't quite Captain Phasma-ish. But you could still get her tone in a sort of a cold British thing. I ended up playing quite a lot of British people after that as well. So she paved the way. Um, I am, um, listen, it's going to send me to sci-fi conventions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's, I'm, I'm absolutely elated and grateful to Lindsay Halper and to, to have on your resume, Lucas Arts. Mm. You know? Big. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I'm not worthy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. We'll, we'll go one more each, same order, guys. Um, so whenever you were doing the different roles for uh, for Star Wars, and like you said, there are so many things that involve um, an NDA, is it ever like a disjointed feeling whenever you see the finished product? Um, kind of because you don't exactly know what it's going to play out, especially in a voice role. Like you said, you're just, you know, kind of, especially with some of the video game characters doing a voice over and over and over and over again. Is there like a, an interesting um, separation between you and the character whenever you see it uh, on, come on the screen? Or is it kind of like you did it so many times in your head, it feels natural? Wow, that's a really interesting question because everything is so, I think you're talking about Skyrim or, yeah, a, or and a big video game like that. Yeah. Every video game that you do, first of all, just so your listening audience can picture this, you're by yourself. So we're never in a room with the rest of the cast, and people are always surprised about that. And you do a couple of versions of each line because we don't know how the other actor 
let's say you're doing a scene with your sister, a sister character in there, or your lover, or, you know, you're a, 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 a wench in Merry England and you're a barmaid and how will the other character act against you? So you have no clue what they're going to use. So when you see the game, you don't know what take they're going to use. You don't know what version they're going to use. And remember, the player has the choice to pick different versions of what you're going to do. So for me to yeah. sit and watch a game like Skyrim, which I don't sadly have the time to do, I've only seen sections of it, I have no clue what you as the player is going to pick and what version you're going to get. So, and it's also very disjointed. You don't do like, in a, even though, you know, when you're doing on camera, you sometimes shoot out of sequence if you're doing an episodic or a television series there's still some form of continuity this literally you can do one line where you're crying over your brother who just got killed by a guillotine in france and then all of a sudden you're you're doing a british accent in a comedy scene so it is completely it, it's not linear yeah so the tricky part as an actor and i tell people say to me how can I um, get a video game? Like when, when will I be ready? I'll tell you when you'd be ready, when you can go line by line by line and read it cold because you don't get it in advance because they're so protective of their property and do a full fledged performance and a scene with that one line, a middle beginning and, a, and an end, you know, beginning, middle and an end and make it work in one or two takes. They don't have time. They literally scroll down. So in answer to your question, I have no clue where it's going to end up, and I have no clue how it's going to sound. Oh, wow. <laughs> really. That's really interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. So, Alan, one one TV series that I really liked uh, was called The Dead Zone. Um, I just love the premise of the story. Uh, a man who woke up from a seven-year coma, and he's unlocked a part of his brain, which allows him to see glimpses into the future. Uh, you were able to be on an episode of that show back in uh, 2005, so... What was that like? And, and Anthony Michael Hall, I mean, what, what was he like? Was he a cool guy? Or? Uh, I worked with two uh, rat, rat, rat pack is before my time, Sinatra and all those people, but rat pack, I worked with Molly Ringwald as well. So I all wanted right. to, yeah. Um, he was great. I mean, you know, you're looking at people that you grew up with and uh, I was happy to do it because I'd seen the movie. There was a Christopher Walken movie and I'm a huge fan yeah. of, of Dead Zone, and uh, it was really creepy and eerie. So when they made the show, I was really excited to do it. Um, Anthony worked really hard on the show because I think, you know, it was, I think, one of his first times as sort of an exec producer on it. So he was very um, collaborative, which I like as an actor. And, all, you know, some actors, they don't, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, they don't stay for their close-up. Like after they do their stuff, they leave the room when you're talking to some stage manager who's sort of reading like this or a dot on the wall. But he stayed all the time to help out. And I had, I think I had an episode where I played a mother of a kid who had strange powers. I've done that a few times in series where the kid has strange powers. I think, I can't remember what the power was, but see, see the dead, see dead, I think it was. Um, I would again another sort of iconic um, show in the sci-fi canon. So I was thrilled oh, to do yeah. that. Yeah, Ellen, you started out as a dancer, correct? You were a ballet dancer. Yeah. Uh, what made you transition from being a ballet dancer to um, acting? Was it a role that you were offered, or did you just get the bug somehow? Sadly, like a sports figure who ruins their knees or their back. I, uh, my career ended with very bad knees at 21 years of age. So I did not want to be an actor. I wanted to be a ballet dancer. Plus I grew six inches. I should have been a basketball player, uh, in one year. I literally sprouted up to this five, almost 5'11 girl. So I, could, I should have played basketball, but I suck at sports. But, um, so circumstances actually made me an actor, a, a tragedy because it was for me the end of my life that I couldn't be a dancer because that's what I wanted to be. And so that moment in time, you know, we all have moments in time where we have to change gears or change the road in our life. You know, just because I wanted it or I dreamed it didn't mean it was going to happen. And physically now, when I look back, to be a ballet dancer, you have to have the aesthetic and be so graceful, but you also have to have the strength of an athlete. And it's a combination of one of the toughest 
careers physically, you know, it's, it's, a, you're truly an athlete, but you have to look graceful and be, you know, 110 pounds to do it. Um, so it was, a, it was a turning point in my life and I got very depressed and I went back to school and, and school, I started to do some shows there just for distraction and because it was part of the credit, we had to do some shows and then I fell in love with stage. So that's how that transitioned from a tragedy in life. I became an actor. Yeah. Interesting. So is, it, is there anything you want to plug that we will see in 2024? Uh, three video games that I cannot announce, but one we sort of mentioned today in a franchise of uh, a big franchise that is the biggest. So that's kind of cool again. Um, you can still see on streaming uh, Dune, and I'm very proud that I worked on Dune, speaking of uh, a franchise that is absolutely beyond huge. It's um, it's unbelievable. You, and, you'll be in the second one when the strike's over? or I cannot say. Cannot and uh, number two, um, Megan, the big horror movie with the, you know, that doll, that crazy doll that's, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. I do the home AI in that, the home AI voice. And apparently if you oh. see the movie, uh, the horror movie, um, there's a, something at the end that could potentially be something else. And um, I've actually been doing some horror movies. And then Cobweb, there's a movie called Cobweb uh, where I play this little girl in the wall who comes out and becomes like, you know, a, a real <laughs> um, kind of thing. So those, those are out right now. Um, and a few, a new, an audio book, a new audio book called All the Pretty Shoes, which I just got nominated for a SOVAS award. I found out two days ago, the Society of Voice Actors Award. And oh, that's nice. going to be a big event in December. So that was really cool to be nominated for a very sad part of history in the 1940s. But, and the woman is still alive. She's 92 years of age. So that to me is a really great accomplishment especially with what's going on in our world right now. So I've had, I've had a very, I'm having an interesting time with my career right now. A lot of different things, a lot of video games and animation. And, oh, I've been narrating some theme parks, some new theme park things, like something in Abu Dhabi, a new under underwater kind of underworld, like water world, speaking of Kevin Costner type of uh, uh, sort of big attraction. So, and, and you can go to my website, ellendubin.com, and that's, everything will be updated there as to what I can say. Excellent. Well, thank you, Ellen, so much for joining us. We, we appreciate you giving us your time. Thank you for having me, and thank you for educating me on sports movies. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, I'll remind everybody, hit that like, subscribe, notification button. Check out her website, you know, and you can you can see her her filmography on there, everything that she's done, and, and catch one of her movies or TV shows or, or video games. Go to Disney, you'll hear her voice as well. So uh, she's she's a little bit everywhere. Everyone, thank you for watching. Have a great night. We'll see you all next time.